good day to be in God's house. I love the Gospel of Mark, chapter number five. Uh, it is probably one of my favorite chapters uh, in all of God's Word. Believe it or not, it's just spoke to me and spoke to me and spoke to me. I actually uh, wrote a um, play on based on Mark chapter five. We performed it uh, twice. Um, had about 25 actors in it. Took about 90 minutes because everything I do is long-winded. It was a uh, it was a lot of fun. Mark, uh, I just love the characters, uh, of people that needed Jesus, that found their fulfillment and their contentment and their satisfaction in Jesus, as it is described in Mark chapter five. We looked at a legion last week. Anybody who has that many demons in their life needs a breakthrough in their life, and he found that breakthrough in Jesus. Now, today we're going to look at uh, two people. One, we do not know their name. We just know she was going through an ailment. The other one, we know his name. He, his name was Jairus, and he was a ruler, as it describes, in the synagogue. A religious person, a person who conformed to the way that people thought church was supposed to be. There were rules and requirements. There were things that you can do, things that you could not do. And he was one who fully gave himself to that. Now, we're all guilty of that, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, even in the way that we dress. Now, there's nothing subliminal about me wearing this. Rada said I look like Christmas, and I hadn't thought about it, but I kind of do look like Christmas, don't I? <laughs> But I, what I found is that you get all these sweaters given to you and you only get one time a year to wear them, so you better take advantage of them while you can. Amen? By the way, can I... My wife said this morning to me, she said, I've got all these sweaters that you can't wear now because they're called ugly sweaters. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you have them in your closet? Look at this. Can we proclaim ugly sweater Baptist church? This is a free zone. You can wear any of those ugly, and I mean ugly, Christmas sweaters, and we won't say a word. We might think something, but we won't say a word. Is that fair? Now, you're all thinking right now, preacher, quit and go back to preaching. Y'all all right with that? I'll try. I'll try. Here's the thing that we need to learn if we're going to see the secret of Mark chapter 5. If God's going to say something to us in our spirit that we actually need to hear, something that will change us, something that he desires for us, something that will satisfy us, something that will make us useful in his hands, something that will honor heaven today, okay? We live in two worlds at the same time. We live in two worlds right now at the same time. Now, Philippians 3 tells us, uh, verse 20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. I am an American. I was born here. I was raised here. You can tell it by how I talk. I'm a, I'm a son of the South, or as some people say, the South. I, I can't get away with it. Everything that I have comes from where I was raised, but I'm also a Christian. I am a citizen of heaven. And just as much as you can tell I'm a son of the South by how I talk, I pray that you can tell I'm a citizen of heaven by how I dress, how I think, how I talk, how I live, how I seek to honor him. Two worlds at the same time. We are in parallel worlds. We also live here on earth that has a major influence on our life, but the thing about it is, Jesus said, the person that's the major influence in this world is the prince of the power of the air. You might know him by his personal name, personal name, Lucifer. You also may know him by his job description, the deceiver, Satan, the devil, ugly himself. Please understand that though my citizenship is in heaven, I have joint citizenship, because right now the Lord has placed me here where all of this other stuff <clears throat> is going on. Jim's not here today. Doris's sister passed away this week, and they've gone to Alabama for the funeral, but he made sure I got water. Amen, hallelujah, and praise God. 
Now let's talk a little bit about how we're supposed to live in this world. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, um, Valerie, you don't have to try to keep up with me. We'll just stay in Mark 5 and I'll get there. In Galatians chapter 1, it says, Grace to you, peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, praise God for that, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. He will deliver us from this present evil age. So though we are here and we can't escape it, we don't have to live like this world acts. We have a higher calling on our life. Now, we can act like the world because the world will influence us, or we can act like heaven because Jesus influences us. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5 says this, We have tasted the good word of God, here's key word, listen, and the powers of the age to come. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. But as a citizen of heaven... There are benefits that God has given us. The power of heaven is now available to us in this life. Now you can either have it or miss it. You can either understand that God says, I've presented a beautiful table of all my delicacies. You can come and sit down and enjoy until you're fully satisfied, or you can go stand in the corner and be miserable if you want to. There are things that God has said, I will give you. He has given us eternal life now. He's given us the nature of God now. He's given us the peace of heaven now. No weapon ever formed can attack heaven, and he has said no weapon can attack you. Now, in this season of the year, it's a wonderful time of the year. It's a glorious time of the year. Jesus is the reason for the season. But it's one of Satan's best times of the year because he comes with pain. He comes with disappointment. He comes with loneliness. When everyone else is celebrating, there are those that are left out. There are those that feel like they don't go with the drift of this world. They don't like, they want to be accepted by everyone. And the world says, if you act like him, I'm not going to accept you. Now, I know your heart. I know you love God. And you want to have peace with everyone. But you can have the peace of heaven now. You can have the power of heaven now. We simultaneously live in this world and the next world, the seen and the unseen. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Galatians 1.3, it says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. I hope you heard that. Every spiritual blessing. Now, you don't have to wait till we get thin to have it in your life. It fits your heart. He wants you to have it. He wants to bless you. Second Peter says this, His divine power has granted to us Come on. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Here's the sticking point. This happens by belief. This happens by trust. This happens by attaining the power of God now. This, this happens the word that he uses is by faith. You can have it. It's already taken care of. You just have to believe. Come on, let's get into some tough words. We have to trust. We have to live. By faith, we must grasp and attain. Now, in Mark 5, we're going to find two people who do this. And I'm going to be real honest with you. Most of the people who hear me preach want me to preach down to the level of your acceptance. As a matter of fact, a fact the more I do that, the more you like it, and the more praise you'll give me. 
if I preach down to your level of comfort, of your level of belief, of your level of acceptance, I'm sorry I can't do that. Instead of bringing it down and, down and fitting you, why don't we rise up and fit Jesus? Instead of tickling ears, let's get into the hard basics of life where Jesus, I've already read the scripture to you, he says he wants to bless you like you've never been blessed before. You can have it. You believe in grace. You believe in his love. You know that he wants to do for you, right? So by believe, by that tough word of living, trust, by being getting to the place where we're just going to, by faith, join him, great things can happen. And as you read this scripture, you're going to see a vast difference by the normal way that we live our life and by the way that these people that we're going to meet today lived their life. How much do we miss because the answer is just beyond our reach? And we wait for God to drop it in our laps, but we have to reach out and receive it by faith. Let's walk in Mark chapter 5. Charles always tells me my, my introductions are longer than my sermons, and he's right. We're going to spend a little bit talking about the second person in the personality before we got, talk about the first person. The first person is in verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. Soon as he comes back, the people who knew him, the word got out, Jesus is back, Jesus is back. Remember, he had already preached that powerful message, and then he stayed in the boat and went over because there was some work that needed to be done in the Decapolis. But now he's come back because he needs to be there with his people. This is his launch out point. When word got there, the word is multitude. Not just multitude, it says great multitude gathered to him. He was by the sea. Now, you know, it doesn't say it here, but because that multitude was there, he spent time with them. He preached to them. He probably did some healing. He probably did some helps. He probably comforted some souls. I don't know all the things that were happening there, but some Jesus stuff was happening. All right? So then we get to verse 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. He's one of my heroes. He wasn't going to be held back by, by the, the laws of the synagogue. He wasn't going to be held back by what everybody at the synagogue would say about him or think about him. There was something in his life that was going to push him out of his comfort zone. And what was it? It was his daughter. When he saw him, he says it fell at his feet. That is to worship. That is a sign. He went to Jesus. He got right down on his feet. And he's, he's talking to him up there, but he's down here. That says, I don't care about pride. I'm going to get down because there's something most important. He had heard about Jesus. He had probably heard some sermons. He didn't care what everybody else said. He knew that Jesus was the answer. As a matter of fact, he left his house with his daughter that was so sick. You know any good father would take his child to the doctor. The doctor had probably not only made one house call, but it probably made many house calls, but nothing changed. Things got worse. Now, if you're a loving father, what are you going to do? You're going to do whatever you need to do. And something, come on, listen to me now. Something sparked in his heart. The same way that it sparks in our hearts. A thought. Jesus can help. Jesus can help. Now, everything that he had been taught, everything from the association of his people said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We'll pray another prayer. We'll read some Old Testament scripture. We'll... We'll talk about all those other things, but, but let's, let's keep that over there. I believe this, but I want it not just here, I want it here. And this is the part that gets in the way. So I need to take this, I understand it here, but I need to get it practically in my heart and in my life. So Jairus knew about Jesus, 
knew his daughter's condition and said, I've got to go. And it knocked him down to the feet of Jesus. And it says there in, in verse 23, and he begged him. What was he wearing? Priestly robes. But none of that other stuff mattered. He gets down, can I use the word? He groveled at the feet of Jesus. Tears were probably flowing down his cheek. When he got to Jesus' feet, he went because he was looking for action. But here's the thing. What Jesus was looking for was action too. And he's seeing this action. There was something in his life, the spark that came, that he's now acting on. Folks, that's called faith. God whispers in your heart. You take it in. You believe it. You trust it. And now you're going to act on it. And he's there and he's begging. He, listen to what he says. My little daughter, 12 years of age, lies at the point of death. I mean, it, we're not talking about maybe, possibly. She's just sick, but it, it could. No, to the point of death. Now listen to this statement of faith. Come, <laughs> lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. It doesn't say it in the Scripture, but everywhere Jesus went, somebody was begging for something. Could it possibly have been that He had seen it before? Now He wanted to see it for Himself. How many times I've seen the power of God fall on you and others but I need to see it for me. New Holland, I want to see it here. I believe Jesus can. And I'm, I'm willing to get down on my knees and beg for it. Because I want to see something that's unmistakably Jesus that can come in and change all the other circumstances. Well, Jesus went with him. Verse 24. And a great multitude followed him, and the New King James uses this word, thronged him. I, I kind of thought I knew what this meant, but I, I, I looked it up, and the word throng means not only are they there, they are, it means to push in from every side. So it's not like they're just here. They're here, they're behind him, they're over here, and they all, I, I think you know what I mean when I say this, they all wanted a piece of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're putting themselves and they're going after him because they, they want some good in their life too. I hope y'all came today because you want a piece of Jesus. I, if Jesus were right here right now, I think everybody in this room, you would not be so dignified. You'd be trying to get to him. Amen? And all I can tell you is, is, is when God says, Brian, your job here on earth is done, you breathed your last breath. Come home, old boy. They better get out of the way. I don't care how many are in heaven, and I don't care how they're thronging. I'm going to get close as I can. Don't y'all act so dignified. You're going to do the same thing. I'm just going to probably do a few flips on the way there, but I'm going to get to his feet to say thank you. I love you. I appreciate you. But Jesus says, I'll go. I'll go. Now, Verse 25, get the picture. Everybody's coming against him. Let's, introduce, let's get introduced to this woman. Somebody reach up there and unplug that clock. Verse 25. We don't know her name. It just says a certain woman. It, it doesn't matter. You don't, anybody can come. Anybody, it doesn't matter what you got, what your issue is. Nobody's ever too late. You're not going to impose. Just speak your heart. You're not going to make him shake his head. He's not going to be frustrated. Anybody can come. Everybody can come. She had a flow of blood for 12 years. Flow of blood. You know, 
one person was an important synagogue officer and one person was just a nobody. Jairus had a daughter who had given him a for joy for 12 years. This woman had had an issue of what they call a fountain of blood. Jairus had money. She had spent all that she had on doctors, had nothing left. One lived in a world where he was ceremonially clean. He was a ruler of the synagogue. Nothing had come in and made him unclean. But this woman, all the time, the issue of blood, you cannot touch blood, you would be ceremonially unclean. She couldn't go to church. Matter of fact, this crowd of people that are thronging around Jesus, if they knew that she had every person she touched, she made them unclean too. But isn't it funny? Whether you were ceremonially unclean or ceremonially clean, there was only one who could actually change you and make you whole. And that was Jesus. So she's getting to a point, she doesn't care about anything else. She had suffered from many physicians. I know what that word, you know what that word suffer means. She had spent all that she had. She was no better. That means she is at a point where she is desperate. She doesn't think there's anything they could do. She rather grew worse. Verse 27, but when she heard, come on, just the news. Once again, something sparked. You think the Lord was just whispering? Something sparked. She's starting to think, could it be me too? Nobody else has been able to help. All the ones who thought that they could help, they were frustrated too. Nothing else. But could it be? Could it be? I pray that all of us, when we hear that spark in our heart, do not reason it away. Do not say, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe they should do that someday. Oh, they could do that for Brother Brian. He studied the Word. He's preached many messages. Maybe God would do it. Do you understand that when the spark comes to you, the blessing can come to you? Come on. But the expectation of faith lies within you too. When the whisper when that comes to your heart, it you don't have to... Oh, I, play, I wish we could all hear this. You don't have to wonder if that's God. You know His voice. And you know He speaks blessing. Well, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind Him. Jairus came face to face with Him. She comes up from behind Him in the crowd. She knows she's not supposed to be there. And she just touched His garment. She probably, so weak, just kind of gave it one of those. <gasps> she may have even been on her knees because of the crowd of people. And, and whatever it was, maybe, maybe it was his robe. Maybe it was his prayer tassels. I don't know. But she, she had said in her heart, a little touch. She didn't have to come and say, lay hands on me. She had she'd heard Jesus had done that. Jesus will do it however He so wants to. He, he's bigger than the box that you try to put Him in. If I can just touch His clothes, I shall be made well. And she did. And verse 29 uses the word immediately. When I prayed to accept Jesus Christ in my heart, I immediately became a citizen of heaven. I didn't have to go to a discipleship class. I didn't have to sign a card. I didn't have to get the pastor's permission. Matter of fact, when I walked the aisle that day, I went straight past the pastor because he was my dad. And I went straight to my knees because that's where the transaction was made from my heart to God's heart. I had a direct line and didn't even know it. And heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I felt like I was going to burst but when Jesus touched me, I felt joy exceedingly. Where's my daughter at? Jody, I felt it to the uttermost. I felt it to the uttermost. I felt it to the uttermost. 
and the tears went away and the smile was there because he touched me. And I was different. The guilt was gone. The joy came in. I had a head-on collision with the Holy God. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. Now, she knew what it felt like to gush the blood. But she felt whole. The fountain. She felt it in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus also immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him. Please don't miss this. The power of God is available. The abundant power of heaven but it left him and went to her so that she could be to the place of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now, the disciples tried to give logic to Jesus. Don't you just love those people who try to correct you? I mean, they always have advice. They always try to tell you, you don't understand. How in the world can you say who touched me? People are thronging against you. They're trying to reach out and grab you. It's happening all the time. And he said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Who touched me? He looked around to her, verse 32, who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, she, she wanted to leave. Can I get a touch of Jesus and y'all don't even look at me and I'll just go home happy in Jesus? There's something about a public profession. There's something about a public testimony. If Jesus is willing to touch your life and change your life, can you not just be happy enough to let everybody else know? Would you be, how many of you would be ashamed of somebody who gave you heaven? How many of you, if you're proud of it, if you're grateful for it, you're not going to be ashamed of it. Well, the woman fearing and trembling, <laughs> she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She said the whole story, probably through tears. She shared it all. She didn't hold anything back. And he said to her, by the way, did he lay hands on her? No. Did he speak so that she could be healed? No. She just, by her faith, she reached out to touch him because she said, if I just touch him, I'll be whole. She's already whole. But Jesus made a proclamation. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Whole. Complete. We've been studying this in Sunday school. The word blessed in the Beatitudes, blessed are the... It means fully satisfied. Blessed are those who are fully satisfied. Your faith has made you well. You already have peace, so now go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, I said a public profession was important. You're going to now understand why it's important. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Teacher, or your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? They knew where he went. He had told the people in his house, I'm going to find Jesus. So the daughter has already died. The servant goes to tell them. So they find him at just this moment and said, Jairus, I'm sorry. It's too late. It's too late. She's gone. Somebody needs to hear this right now. I don't know who it is. It's not too late. It's not too late. I don't care. I can't think of a more definite point than death. Can you? Your love is still there, but there's nothing else that can happen. He had just seen a miracle of miracles. He went from the high of highs, come on, in just a second, to the low of lows. He's probably saying, if only. 
And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Fear will overcome faith, or faith will overcome fear. Don't be afraid. Just, what's the word? Say it again. Are you willing to do it? Say the word again. Not in me, not in the church, not in anything else, not in the doctor, not in anything else. Are you ready to? If you're ready to believe, Jesus is ready to do something. If you're ready to act on it by faith, if you're ready to move out of the the, the things of this world and to move into the lane that will lead you to glory land, just believe and you can find it. So Jairus is probably saying, okay, okay, I'll go. Jesus said, now the rest of you, get out of here. I I got something I need to do. Peter, James, John, you come to me and and, and you follow me. Verse 38, he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he saw a tumult. That meant there was such an absolutely loud noise, an eruption, and those who wept and wailed loudly. It, It was in that time you know that people would come And it's almost showing how much you love by how loud you got. He came in and he said to them, why are you making this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. There's a message on this. The Bible says that we sleep in Jesus Christ. And when we die here, our soul goes to heaven. In the beautiful hands of God, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God has no limits, no no boundaries. He's an eternal God. As far as your understanding of all the the vastness of heaven, God goes beyond that. There is no place in all of existence that God is not there. He is not limited by a body. We will get a body when we come back with Him. Our spirit will come back with Him at the rapture, and He will perfectly put us together, and we'll have a new body, an everlasting body. A body like the resurrected Jesus, I understand that. But he said to them, she's just sleeping. Verse 40, they ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They they, they made fun of him. It doesn't matter what the world says. You're either going to understand and follow what the thinking of the world is or what the thinking of Jesus is. I need to say this. There are a lot of religious people who have taken this to the extremes that say that all healing can come through Jesus. All healing can come through Jesus. But I respect God enough to know that if God allows things into our life, it is for our good, and you might need to walk in it. To hear some people, it's like, uh, I can't even let a mosquito bite me because uh, that'll create a whelp on me and it'll itch and if I know Jesus I don't have that no please understand the point here is Jesus the point here is that God will bless God will do exceedingly abundantly above not just in physical healing but in any healing matter of fact physical healing is just a very, very small aspect of it. My body's been dying for a long time, and I can look at y'all and tell you, yours has too. I was with uh, some friends Friday night, and uh, there were six of us that went out to dinner, and we were going to the game together, and we rode together in a car because we were, it was cold. We were going carpool, and we tried to get as close to where we were going. And on the way back to my vehicle, I got in the back seat of one of those things. Now, you know the front seat. Y'all like those. The middle seat's okay. There were three people in it. But then there's those back seats that's like for the little children, like when your knees are up around your chin. And I I was trying to get, I got into it okay, but getting out of it was a, I can tell you this body's not what it used to be. Can I get an amen? Right. We all know that. We all are dealing with different aspects of that. But something even greater was about to happen here. When he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, that's Peter, James, and John, and he entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, 
Talitha, Kumai, or Kumi, some say it. Or excuse me, Talitha, which is translated little girl, arise. Once again, here's that word. Immediately, the girl arose <laughs> and walked. She was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. He committed them strictly that no one should know it and said to them something that should be given to her to eat. He said, don't tell anybody. But there's a testimony that's been told even today. You can't keep that news in. It's going to get out. It's a testimony. What it was like this morning when my child was dying, I got to see what happened. Now I got a hug. She's walking around. God is good. Others need to hear that. A testimony is simply what your life was, what it, how it changed, and what your life is now. You can't keep that silent. He didn't want those people thronging around him because he wanted to do ministry. But listen, people need to have hope. People need to know that Jesus is the answer. People vote with their feet. Last week we were at the Civic Center. You know the ones that came? The ones that wanted to come. Now, one of the hardest Sundays to get people to church is after Thanksgiving and before the Christmas season starts, and that's us today. But guess what? You voted with your feet. You act on it. You do what you want to do. By the way, you don't do what you don't want to do. You have what you're going to reach out and grab. You're going to miss what you don't want. That doesn't mean that it's not there. You just so choose not to reach out and get it. God has it, and it's available to us, but here's the trigger. Are we willing to pay the price of belief, love, trust by faith? Are we? Everybody in this room has got prayer requests. Some of you most likely have a greater love for God than I do. You walk through things and you have trust God's working on my life. God's working on your life. If we set a testimony, there are many people who have a wonderful testimony of what God has done, what God could do, family that needs it, community neighbors that need it, a broken world is following the rules of this world, and we know the answer. But we need to speak the name of Jesus as we sung about this morning. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be a long line of people waiting to complain to Jesus <laughs> for all that they had to go through. You know what there's going to be a long line of? People wanting to get to the feet of Jesus. Today, would you rather be in the line to complain? how life came up short? Or would you rather be in the line to say thank you, Jesus?